I call Baroness Fox of Buckley. My Lords, outside of this place, this Amendment 87B is causing quite a lot of excitement and anticipation, certainly a lot of interest on social media and in the press and amongst the NGO world and women's groups, as we've heard. It's been directly linked to the tragic and brutal murder of Sarah Everhard. The force of society, who along with groups such as Hope Not Hate and the White Ribbon Organisation in Tal Mama and others that we've heard about, have focused their lobbying on the need to act now against violence against women. We're told now it's the time to change, and that was echoed by the noble Baroness, Baroness Kennedy of Cradley, when she introduced this amendment. We have been asked to vote for this amendment because it will make misogyny a hate crime and will require all police forces to record where crimes are motivated by hatred of women. However, my lords, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors here, and I think we need to be careful about allowing an emotive tragedy to be exploited in a way that won't help women and won't enhance this bill. I understand that when something as brutal as Sarah's murder captures the public imagination, there's a desire to do something. For any of us who have been the unfortunate victims on the receiving end of violent sexual attack, let me tell you, I empathise with those expressing sorrow, anger and a feeling that they need to act. Whether attending a vigil, going on a protest, legal or otherwise, lighting a candle or even demanding more laws. But here in this House, I think we need dispassionate cool heads and to scrutinise exactly what amending this law in this way will achieve. It's hard to be objective when discussing the murder or abuse of women, of course. There may be a temptation to rush to appropriate blame beyond the perpetrator or to ascribe social and cultural explanations beyond the immediate crime. But actually, what's asserted as facts are often, at the very least, contentious or contested political concepts. Misogyny itself is one of those. A reminder that misogyny is popularly understood as hatred of women. But in the last week, and even today, it's been hinted at, the police have been described as institutionally misogynist. Is that true, that the police hate women? Or to repeat the mantra, that society is suffering an epidemic of misogynist violence? I don't recognise this nightmarish, catastrophizing vision. In the Nottinghamshire pilot that's been mentioned on misogynist hate crime and measuring it, misogyny can include catcalling, following, unwelcome approaches, and those can be conflated with flashing and groping and then more serious uh, 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 assaults. And that's all thrown into the misogynist hate crime category. And meanwhile, as we've heard from another noble lord, Hope Not Hate's lobbying email for this amendment told us, and I quote, that ideological misogyny is increasingly at the core of far-right thinking, including the threat of far-right terrorism. So we've gone from wolf whistling to terrorism. So I don't think we can even assume there's any shared meaning of misogyny. So I do think it's unhelpful to tack it on to a bill on domestic violence or domestic abuse. My Lords, I personally don't think that misogyny is widespread in society. And I certainly don't believe that domestic abuse is driven by ingrained hatred of women. That, it seems to me, flies in the face of all the nuance and complexity and evidence that we've heard in the many hours that we've discussed this bill, whether it's our understanding of the impact of alcohol or mental health, to the recognition that there are male victims or the debate that we've just had on pornography. But I understand that perhaps opinions are not enough, and I acknowledge that this amendment is an attempt at collecting data to assess how much domestic abuse is driven by prejudice, by anti-women prejudice. However, if you want accurate data, I don't think that we should look to hate crime solutions because hate is almost impossible to objectively define. This amendment states that the person who defines this hate is the complainant, 
The police will be asked to collect data based on what, quote, the victim or any other person perceived that the alleged offender at the time of or in the recent period before or after the offence demonstrated hostility or prejudice. So what would be recorded is when an accuser, quote, perceived the crime to be motivated wholly or partly by hostility or prejudice. This is not a reliable way to uh, collecting accurate data and won't help us understand perpetrators' behaviour as it is based on perceptions, dangerously subjective and untestable legally, but also with some wholly undesirable potential outcomes. This can only encourage individuals, it seems to me, to attribute motives to others. And even if they are completely wrong about those motives or intentions, the police will record this as hate-driven. This flirts dangerously close to legislating thought crime. It could well lead to finger-pointing, malicious allegations, the stigmatising of all manner of behaviours and the labelling of all manner of speech as hateful prejudice. And we already know that the fear of being accused of prejudice or hate is one key factor in chilling free speech. Being officially counted by the police as a bigot would inevitably affect free expression and close down debate. No doubt some of you will say that I should stop privileging free speech over this amendment because it will mandate the police, to quote the charities, to gather crucial evidence about the extent, nature and prevalence of hostility towards women and girls and how it relates to domestic abuse. But let's be clear, this is actually an illusion too, even a deception, because to present this amendment as having anything to do with women or girls is not true, because women aren't mentioned in the wording and they are not the focus at all of the amendment. In fact, the language used is very particular and purposeful. An amendment championed in the public realm as anti-misogyny and assumed to be about women talks of hostility towards persons who are of a particular sex or gender. And this can only muddy the waters and make any data collection unreliable and opaque. And I think citing the Law Commission as an explanation for the wording doesn't work because the Law uh, Commission hasn't yet reported. Gender is not defined in UK law and is a cultural identity, malleable, subjective, one of choice. Sex is, however, a material objective reality. The Office for Statistics Regulation recently emphasised the need for clarity about definitions and stressed that sex and gender should not be used interchangeably in official statistics. And it gave the example of criminal justice statistics, highlighting that variation in the way that data about sex is captured across the system means it's not possible to know what definition of sex is being captured. And this, in turn, places limitations on how some criminal justice statistics can be interpreted and used. And I would say, and I'm quoting here from the new resource Sex Matters, that by adding the word gender into this confusing mix, this amendment undermines any possibility of accurate information being accrued, let alone the prior problem that that information is based on perception, subjective perception. If our intention is for the police to track whether domestic abuse crimes against women are based on prejudice and hatred, that should be simple enough to do if the police have a clear definition and a reliable data field for the sex of victims and perpetrators. This amendment won't help and it will confuse the situation. My Lords, if there is one example of misogyny in plain sight, surely it's here. If I thought erasing the word woman from the maternity bill was bad, not naming women in an amendment on misogyny seems even worse. And more grotesque, this could mean that women will be labelled by the police as misogynistic perpetrators if they are perceived as hosti hostile to a person's gender in a domestic setting. The mother who misgenders their child, are they the perpetrator, the hate criminal? The female staff at a women's refuge whose position on sex-based rights and service provision is perceived as motivated by prejudice. This highly charged and febrile atmosphere of the last week, of which I am very sensitive, focusing on violence against women, must not pressurise us into passing an amendment that will allow this bill to be the midwife of criminalising women with gender-critical views and won't anyway help us understand uh, or help any victim of domestic abuse.